we're on. Um, hello, guys. Today in this talk, uh, Umberto, Fabrizio, and I are going to talk about the pulp operator and the benefits of deployments in the Kubernetes environment. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is an overview of the talk, and we'll start with some Kubernetes introduction and the benefits it provides. We'll go for the uh, regular tools, which uh, are Kubernetes-based, which is Helm and operators. Each of them have their use cases and uh, benefits. And then I will hand it over to Umberto and Fabrizio, who will uh, talk in the greater detail about Pulp Operator. And they're going to show us some uh, demo too. Next slide, please. Uh, so what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is an open source container or orchestration uh, framework, and it helps you manage uh, applications made up of a lot of containers and helps you manage them uh, in different environments, uh, whether it's uh, a bare metal, physical, virtual machine, uh, cloud, or hybrid uh, deployments. And so let's look into what problems does it solve. So with the move from the monolith to the microservice usage, uh, there was an increased usage of the container technology uh, because containers offer a perfect host for uh, small and independent uh, applications like microservices. And so what do we see nowadays is we have very big deployments composed of hundreds or thousands of containers. Now managing those containers uh, especially across different uh, deployments with the scripts or self-made tools, especially if taking into account the upgrade path, might be very complex and sometimes nearly too impossible. And so this kind of scenario uh, created uh, the need of a tool which would be properly managing uh, containers, a lot of containers. And so this is how the Kubernetes em emerged. So what does it offer? It offers high availability, scalability, and uh, disaster recovery. Uh, nearly every cluster, every Kubernetes cluster has its uh, every component replicated. It's automatically load balanced, meaning that it doesn't uh, leave any chances for the bottlenecks in the application. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this kind of uh, Kubernetes cluster setup can be achieved also outside of Kubernetes by other platforms, uh, for example, like Amazon Web Service or your own setup. However, Kubernetes offers certain benefits. Um, with the Kubernetes, it's much easier to have pod replication. Uh, you can uh, define for the Kubernetes deployment file how many replica pods do you want, and the Kubernetes component will just take care of that. Uh, Kubernetes has great self-healing properties, uh, meaning that the controller process will watch over the replica pods and will recreate them whenever they die. Uh, Kubernetes also deals out of the box with the data persistence and the doc data persistence and Docker volumes across different nodes, uh, meaning that whenever a pod is getting recreated, it can uh, reuse existing volumes. And last but not least, uh, Kubernetes has this amazingly great uh, smart scheduler, uh, which takes care of uh, whenever it creates a replica pod, it uh, takes into account the current workloads of the nodes and available resources. Uh, and, and so imagine you would have like hundreds or thousands of worker nodes, and you wouldn't need to think where exactly to create the pod, uh, Kubernetes will figure it out on your behalf out of the box. Um, yeah, so all of this is provided by the Kubernetes and it uh, makes it life easier to manage bigger deployments. Uh, next slide, please. So we, go, we will go quickly over the Helm charts and operators, which are tools based on Kubernetes. Uh, next slide, please. So Helm charts uh, are used because it offers a certain amount of features. You can think of uh, Helm as a package, package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, think of it of um, something like YAM or apt. Uh, and so it's a very convenient way to have a collection of uh, 
a packaged collection of uh, YAML files and have them distributed in the repository. And uh, very often there are common uh, deployments in uh, Kubernetes uh, clusters which require to have a configured a uh, regular set of services like uh, secrets and config map and stateful set. And so to configure each of that service, you would need to have a deployment file. And so instead of uh, every time writing down the deployment file uh, and uh, configure that and test it out, you can create a bundle of uh, those YAML files and that bundle would be known as a Helm chart. Uh, so as a result, you can create a Helm chart, upload it to a private or public repository and also let other people uh, use it. So as a result, to create a Helm chart is quite easy uh, and fast and it's reusable. Um, another great feature Helm offers is a templating engine. So one can create a template file, a common blueprint, with, with which you can configure, which we, you can use by configuring across the clusters only by replacing the placeholders uh, by uh, dynamically evaluated values. And so instead of having like a, a file per each of the deployment, you can have just uh, one file. Uh, so that's very convenient. Uh, however, since it's a templating uh, language, it's very static. It doesn't have uh, whatsoever logic evaluation uh, because Helm is using a Kubernetes declarative uh, language, meaning that you declare to the system what the end state should look like. And that's all what it uh, cares and takes care of. And so Helm charts are really great for day one deployment. Uh, however, it doesn't do that well when it comes to the day two management. Uh, and this is usually where some unpredictable issues can uh, come up and it needs and requires some manual intervention. And at this point, uh, usually operators come in handy because they're great at the day two management. Uh, so operators can be installed via the different sources. Uh, also, it can be installed by the Helm charts or via the OLM, which stands for the operator lifecycle management. You can look at it as a wizard or similar. Uh, so what operators do at core, they replace a human operator with a software operator by embedding and automating the knowledge of uh, sysadmins. And so every single manual step, which is being taken by DevOps, is incorporated into the operator logic. As a result, uh, operator has the knowledge and the intelligence how to deploy, run, uh, maintain and monitor the app and react in case of some problem which can appear uh, after like day one deployment and during the day two or day three management. And so usually uh, these are the apps uh, which have uh, business specific logic or uh, stateful apps which require manual intervention and people to operate those apps. And uh, usually Kubernetes doesn't have out of the box uh, native, uh, native solutions for this kind of applications. And here comes to the rescue operator. In the nutshell, operator takes Kubernetes components as a base together with the control uh, loop mechanism and, is, and adds uh, domain and app specific knowledge. And as a result, it can automate the whole application lifecycle. So operators are very powerful. Uh, they also extend Kubernetes API by defining, by defining custom components and uh, custom resources by defining the custom resource definitions. And in addition to that, it can automate not only Kubernetes resources, but any kind of resources given that that resource has an API available for which you can talk to. So a specific example would be, um, for example, based on some Slack message, or a tweet, you can make the operator redeploy pods. Or if, for example, the credentials have been changed in the uh, secret service, a notification can come to the admins so they can, you know, take any actions or if, if there are any like needs to react on such event. And so, as you can see, 
uh, there is quite a lot of investment uh, in the beginning into the operators, but in the long run, it pays off because as a result, it can automate basically the whole application lifecycle. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Umberto and Fabrizio so they can take it into the greater detail uh, about the pulp operator specifically. Thank you, Fina. Uh, now that we had a quick introduction about Helm and operators, why pop operator or how can pop operator help me? Uh, looking at this picture, we can see that pop has a lot of comp components. Uh, pop, pop operator will simplify the installation and configuration of them by doing all these state steps based on what is defined in a manifest in a custom resource. So the operator will basically transform this into this. But you may be wondering, we could have achieved the same by using Helm shards, which would be so much easier to, to implement. What is the additional value using operators? Uh, Indeed, uh, as, we, as Ina said in a previous slide, both Helm and Operator can make the provisioning of Kubernetes resources easier. But in addition to help with pub installation, we are also doing things like um, verifying if multiple types of storage were defined for the same component. Uh, for example, it will fail if you define that you want a persistent one, but you also pass the credentials to use and object storage. Or if you didn't pass any storage configuration at all, you deploy all components with an empty gear and ephemeral storage. And uh, if we look at the manifest from the previous slide, uh, you'll not notice that there is no definitions like what is the database address or the content origin URL. Uh, we never defined the config map or a secret, and even this way, the operator will create the pub settings, the settings.py file for us, config file for us. Uh, we never defined the others and credentials to access the cache server, the Redis, and uh, the operator will handle these settings for us too. Um, the operator will automatically uh, redeploy a component in case of deletion. Depending on the com component, it will also reconcile and mod modification made directly into it. But again, you may be wondering how can it reconcile a deployment with the content from this CR if we have only uh, a definition of the number of replicas? Uh, in this case, it will reconcile with the default values. The, that manifest is a very, very simple sample. To get an, an idea of the fields available, uh, you can check our documentation or just run kubectl explain, which will output all the fields available in the operator. Just to show that. Here, you can see the list of all of the possible configurations through the operator. Uh, we, we decided to not reconcile some resources like config maps and secrets. We took this decision to avoid losing data in case a user was not aware of the controller synchronization. Uh, we also have some OpenShift specific configurations like allowing to configure routes instead of ingress or node port services. And for host clusters, we are also automating some steps in case of a need of configuring custom CAs. Um, the operator uh, can also do a backup and restore of the resources. It is still in alpha stage. We are now focusing on making making sure that the provisioning of pub is working and to ensure some Kubernetes resources reconciliation. I have a question. You mentioned that 
you don't have to provide the Redis credentials or the database credentials. Uh, does that mean that the operator will create a new Redis service for you and a new Postgres service, configure them, and then use the setting and then create the settings for them? Is that is, is my understanding correct? Exactly. Yep. That, that's okay. exactly what will happen if you don't provide any of them. But in the demo, we we will see that it is also possible to pass a secret, and the operator will use this external database or external cache server. Cool. So um, I prepared an environment. I prepared an environment with PUP already running to avoid spending time with installation. But if you still would like to see and understand how to install the operator, we have two great videos where we explain this process. Uh, I will put the links in the chat later. Mm, OK. So in the left corner, I let a watch running with the output from the operator status condition. So from here, we can follow what the operator is doing uh, in the top. Can you, can you tell us more about that those statuses? Just quickly go through these. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, these, uh, this, I was call it condition. This condition uh, is used to see if the operator run all of the, the uh, all of its tasks like uh, there is nothing else pending for the operator to run okay uh, this one is for the api meaning uh, i don't know the deployment is ready the service account the config map secrets all of the api uh, the api related resources are in a ready state all of them were provisioned or re were reconciled uh, the same for the content, for the worker, for in this case, we have pub web running. So in this case, we have pub web ready. But if you had, I don't know, database, uh, I will explain later. But in this uh, environment, I didn't deploy the Postgres. But if we had Postgres, we could see here a uh, status for the database or one for the routes and so on. Cool. Thank you. Uh, here, you can see the status of the pods which you can, if you don't know a lot of Kubernetes, you can think like a container. So we have the API containers. Actually, we have only one here. The content, the Redis, web, and worker. All of them are in a ready state and running. And at the bottom, uh, I let the output from the logs, the operator logs. OK. Uh, if we look at the resources here, uh, we can see the API deployment, the content, uh, the worker, uh, the pub web, which is the our reverse proxy load balancer, and the cache. But if you remember the architecture, the the picture that I showed in a previous slide. Uh, you notice that we are missing the database. We are missing Postgres. Uh, this is because for this installation, I um, I configured the operator to use an external database, an external instance of Postgres. Uh, the, the Postgres could be installed in anywhere, like uh, in the cloud, uh, in a, uh, AWS, RDS, or in a bare metal server, or even in another namespace in the same Kubernetes cluster, which is uh, the type of installation that I'm using here. Yeah. Uh, and did you choose to do it this way just to show us that it's possible to do that? Yes, and because I have no other uh, environment to do that, I have no. Uh, I don't know. I, I have no bare metal or access to yeah. AWS to to do this configuration. Well, isn't there isn't there the other option of just having um, Postgres be deployed by the operator? Yes, it is. And, but 
for for the demo, I just I'm just using another uh, an external instance not deployed by the operator just to show that it's possible. True. Cool. Uh, That's what connect. I wanted to. Okay. Cool. That's what I want to clear up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and just to to show how we did it in the operator, we have a field called called external DB secret, where we pass the name of a secret, and in this secret, and in this secret, I pass the parameters to connect to the external database. But again, if we didn't pass any of these, uh, the operator would create a database for us automatically. So let's see the operator in action. Uh, if I delete this deployment or any of any one of them, the operator should realize that something is missing and reprovision a new one for us. So let's try to do that. In this visualization, uh, does each dot uh, not dot, but each component represent a pod or a container? Uh, deployment, a deployment which will be responsible for the uh, containers for the pods. I did um, not quite. Uh, you know what is a de deployment resource in Kubernetes? No, and I think that's where my disconnect is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you can think about uh, basically. You can think about deployments like uh, you define the configuration that you want for the pod or for the container and the deployment will ensure that it, the container is running in the expected state in the spec that you define it in the deployment okay Let me show you uh, a deployment Here, uh, in this case these pop Puppy API deployment will ensure that the, the new container will be deployed with this template. Here I'm defining the specification of the pod or the container, mm -hmm. like, the okay. well, like the image and a lot of other configs. Okay. Cool. Uh, so if I delete this deployment, the operator should uh, recreate it for us. Uh, oh, wow. The visualization gets updated right away, also. Yeah, it is kind of uh, immediate. Or it is yeah, yeah, no, fast. it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, another thing to notice is that since I'm not passing any kind of storage configuration, um, the, the operator is warning us about using an empty gear, which means if the pod is deleted, uh, all of the the information or all of the pub pack artifacts or packages started in it will be lost. So since we are not using an persi um, external persistent phone, losing the pod will lose all of the da data in it. Uh, okay. Now let's see another example of what the operator can do. Uh, another question about Kubernetes, I think. Uh, can a deployment be responsible for more than one pod? Or does one deployment correspond to one pod? Uh, yep, in this case, we are just, uh, just a second. Uh, each deployment is responsible for a single pod, but we could. Uh, just use this as an example now. We could try to, I don't know, increase the number of pods to, you know, for five, 10. But as we can oh, see here, yeah. <laughs> even though I try to scale it each, each to 11, or maybe 12, because uh, 11 terminating plus one that is running, uh, the operator realized that, that, oh, this is not something expected. This is not what you have in your uh, CR in our custom research. So the oper operator immediately reconciled our chance. And 
it, it is terminating all of the pods that I tried to. to so it's telling the human you're them. doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, you should not be changing it through the deployment. You should be uh, managing it through the operator. Okay, cool. So uh, just as another example, uh, we could also, I don't know, change the strategy to recreate you. Uh, and it, it, the operator already uh, has synced at the configuration to run of the. So how can, what is the way to configure it persistently? Uh, how can we persist our chance? Uh, we need to add the custom resource, the uh, manifest. So in this case, since we are trying to modify an API stack, I'm going to change here the API, for example, the number of replicas. And also we said about the strategy that we tried to change from running updates to recreate. And for example, if you don't know how to do that, you can well, OC explain. Oh, here is that API. We have a field called strategy. And in this field, we can use the type recreate. So we modify here the strategy. And so what, what is the difference between recreate and rolling update? Uh, the recreate will ensure that only a, all, uh, all of the pods are deleted uh, or terminated before creating new ones. This is to ensure uh, applications like uh, my application cannot be running different version at the same time to avoid, you know, uh, how can I say, uh, not disruption, but inconsistent yeah, data or yeah, yeah, yeah. problems. Yep. And for the running update, we can. I don't know if you remember. It's for zero downtime upgrades. So that if your application supports running different versions, you can just do a roll update. Cool. Exactly. Yeah. It will ensure a minimum number of replicas running at the same time. At the same time. Awesome. OK. Uh, and <laughs> while we were talking, the operator already uh, updated all of the things for us. It is finished. It finished its execution. So uh, another example of what the uh, what the operator can do. Um, if we think about OpenShift cluster or even Kubernetes, uh, PubWeb is not a great way to you to be used as a load balancer since OpenShift and Kubernetes has the routes or uh, ingress as load balancers. So instead of having a route in front of a pop web, which will balance the traffic to the API and content containers, uh, if you think about this, this architecture, we would have two layers of load balancers. And to avoid that situ situation, uh, you can use the operator to to do all of the things for us, like uh, instead of using PubWeb, it will deploy a route and uh, balance the traffic between the API and content containers. So let's do that. Let's see that in action. We just need to modify the ingress type, which is now defined as uh, node part. And as soon as I define it as route, it should delete the PubWeb deployment or containers and also create all of the routes for us, which is already done. So if we check the routes now, they are, uh, they are all there, uh, all here. And now our pub is available outside. So we can do things like uh, oops, API, place status, and it's running. We could also if you want to try, we could also create in a browser or anywhere. Mm, okay, and as a last example, uh, we know, we already know that the operator can 
uh, he deployed everything for us and uh, it can reconcile and ensure an expected stage. But what if you would like to persist your modifications? For example, um, what if you like it the, the way that the operator deploys or install PUP, but you don't want it um, modifying your configs? You want to manage your cluster manually. Uh, uh, or, which, which aspects of the cluster? Uh, all of PUP resources, like the deployments, the config maps, everything that PUP, that the operator deployed. Uh, what if you don't want that the reconcile the operator reconciled the stuff that it deployed that the operator deployed? Okay. So in this case, uh, another example of usage of or situation where we don't want the operator reconcile re reconciling the things is during a troubleshooting, where for some reason we need to modify a step or modify a config that. Is not managed, it's not uh, exposed through the CR. So, for these situations, we can edit PUP and we, could, we can put the operator in an unmanaged stage, which is kind of, uh, I could say, putting it in a disabled state. So, the operator will do nothing in this case. So, if we try to delete, I don't know, the deployment state, uh, PUP API. You can see that nothing will happen, or I don't know if we delete all of the routes. No one is getting recreated. And again, if you change it to your mind and went to let the operator keep managing the resource, you can just uh, disable the unmanaged state or just delete the field is the same. And again, the operator will fix all of our mess. Uh, that's it for the demo. Now I will pass to Fabricio. All right. So yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about all the changes that we have done, like since the the last PoopCon, and like the biggest one was like here writing the entire operator in Go, and like on on, on, on my last presentation PoopCon last year, I I did a comparison between the Poop operator and Poop installer, and I said like the Poop operator is like pretty easy to install. But once you have an issue, it's really hard to debug. And the installer was the opposite. Like it was hard to install, but easy to debug. And now with the Golang, with the barrier logging, uh, we uh, improved that. So it's really easy to debug and troubleshoot now because uh, the Ansible logs are, were pretty verbose and the, the person would need to know about Ansible to understand what was happening. And now we have like just simple logs, like saying, well, explaining the error messages, like giving, like exposing the line where the issue happened. So um, the, the user can like understand it well and like try to fix it by, uh, it, it's own, but if not, with, with the with the log message, it's easy to like file an issue, and we we can easily assess what what's happening. And the other benefit is like a faster reconciliation. So the Ansible one, as it had to run all the playbooks, all the roles for every deployment, uh, it took like more than 10 minutes and, and now it is done like by seconds. And as it's like a Go code, we can have like functional tests and this, is, this has improved the quality a lot. Like we have written the entire operator in, in 
like, like, like about two months, like we reached the feature parity. So, uh, yeah, we are ensuring that we have better quality and it's easy for us to, uh, to develop it. Uh, next slide, please. And the other change that we had that it's not related to the to the goal based transition is we have uh, on the Pope architecture we have the reverse proxy and we use the web deployment to do this proxy and we, we have like removed this layer now because we had a deployment uh for take care of it and now with the on open shift we can just uh do its proxy uh inside the roads and if you have uh, uh ingress nginx we we also remove the 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 web deployment for that and in all the other scenarios we'll still have the web deployment and Next slide, please. And the other change that we had, we improved the health checks on, on, on the pods. So we are passing the status endpoint and, and assessing it more specifically. Like if you uh, specify that you want a cache on your, on your cluster and the cache is not uh, running, the health check will, 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 will get that. And before we we didn't do that, and we have smarter validation eyes. We are having like we work with the GoLang. It's uh, easier to adapt and and, and to customize uh, some solutions to have more uh, a better validation and better uh, messages for the users. And we are the more pod scheduling options and i think yeah i think that's it from my partner next slide oh, i have a question about those scheduling options what do they what what is that affinity and versus anti-affinity umberto do you know do, do you want me to answer fabrizio or Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now we can configure if we would like to have pods, uh, like the same kind of pods running in the same node or not. For example, uh, consider uh, a hypothetical scenario where, for some reason, all of the API pods was running in the same node. And if these nodes crashes, Everything is lost, like uh, yes, uh, <laughs> you will have downtime. So we can configure the pod affinity or anti affinity to make sure that uh, specific pods will not be running uh, at this in the same load. Or we can say like uh, I don't know, we could set a pod affinity to make sure that API and Redis pods uh, should be running at the same node because of performance like uh, it, it could uh, get the data faster or yeah. we could say that uh, api pods should never be running at uh, all of them in the same node so it should be uh, an, an entire finish okay gotcha that makes a lot of sense and that's really cool and can you maybe also explain a bit more about the smart validation Oh, what does it encapsulate? Because I think you worked a lot on that. Me or Fabrizio? Come on. <laughs> Any of you? You, you were the one that worked more on that. <laughs> <laughs> the script was your yours. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> tell, Umber, tell us about validation. Okay. Um, you know, I have a script that will check if the API or the content, or not for the worker, but for the API and for the content, if they are the process is in a running state. 
before we were just checking if uh, the port 24187, if I'm not wrong. wrong. Yeah, it, the 7 if, one is the API. If that port was in a listening state, which is kind of a dumb verification, a dumb verification, because even though a port could be in a listening state, the pod itself or the process itself could not be in a red state to serve requests. For example, That's right. it could yeah. be running a migration task. So if these smarter validations, we are now checking if the pod is the process, the API process, the Django, or I don't know if I'm telling something wrong, but uh, if pod process is already done its tasks and we, we can send new requests to that pod, or if for some reason it is in a, a traceback state, or if something some kind of error is happening we can also just delete the pod with a liveness probe so uh, it's basically what we are doing through the smarter validations and i think there is additional log logic over some uh, field removal uh, i think operator will whether it reconcile some of the fields you will try to remove and if Fields removal will break the deployment. Operator will make sure that the user cannot really um, break the deployment. I think that's also part of the smart field validation, which was an additional um, validation provided uh, by the top operator. Is it correct? Yep. yep. What kind of fields are these? Like, mm -hmm. what's an example of a field that a user could modify and it not? Be core, uh, PCR, PCR fields, and one of these. In the first, we didn't have any kind of uh, not only validation but reconciliation with Ansible. Like, uh, if you change it, some of these fields, nothing would happen. But now we are trying to ensure that all of these field modifications will be replicated to the state of the cluster. OK. Uh, OK, and what is next for the pop operator? Uh, we are discussing and investigating the possibility of configuring Kubernetes autoscaler to, for pop core components. Uh, components based on custom metrics. For example, if a client made a request to pull a package with hundreds of gigabytes and we have a single core content pod configured with a single unicorn worker, if we had a metric to check the load on the unicorn workers, maybe we could try to upscale or to create more containers based on these metrics. Or another example, uh, we could try to scale the number of PubCore uh, API containers based on the number of the API requests per second, or maybe based on the API response latency. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Looking at the latency and the number of requests. Those are probably the most basic metrics to try to scale. But but we we need to discuss together because uh, i don't know if these metrics are already exposed so i believe that in the future we will need to work together on these yep well, uh, that sounds really cool yeah <laughs> another thing that we are thinking about is the self-healing support based on errors this is something that even though we it is in our radar. We are not yet 100% sure if we are really going to do it. Uh, we were thinking about letting the operator take action in case of an error log, but we don't know if this could be more harmful than helpful because since the same error message could be a symptom for multiple type of issues, trying to automate the fix could put the environment in a worse state. So just some examples of what we thought. Uh, if 
it was something like not enough sta uh, storage space available. We could try to automatically increase the persistent volume size. But again, this is just an example because modifying the PV size is another big issue that needs a lot of more study. It would so model, I'm sorry, can you repeat that last statement? The last uh, sentence? Uh, we, we, we would need a lot of more study. At least, at least I would, because <laughs> I would need to check uh, the storage providers because not not all of them uh, allows resizing. Uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. would also need to check the kind of the storage because what if the storage had no loom or disk space available, or what about the co quota, the namespace quota? So. Uh, the operator would also need to be aware of the remaining quota in the namespace. Uh, another another example of automation that we thought was if the operator found a lot of 401 in the logs, like, I don't know, a thousand uh, unauthorized errors per second, uh, we thought about updating the reverse procs, the ingress or the route, to deny new requests from this source. Mm -hmm. But again, this is just an idea because uh, we don't know if this is something that we could gather from the logs or if this is even possible to do in their ingress, or maybe it is not even in the scope of the operator because it sounds like more a firewall thing. Yeah, I agree. So, yep. But the possibilities That's, are endless. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it only depends on our uh, knowledge on what you automate. Yeah. Um, awesome. I think that that's it for our presentation. Questions? I tried to ask mine along the way, so I'm good. <laughs> I think, Dennis, you asked uh, many of our questions along the way. Outstanding job. An outstanding job in the presentation, gang. That was that was wonderful. So I, ju I just want to add something. Like, uh, we just released the, the goal-based operator. So uh, users that has been using the Ansible operator let us know how it is going and please file issues. And the other thing is we added in our uh, filing issues option, the option to request a demo. So if you want to see more amazing demos like Umberto did, please file an issue requesting that. That's a great idea, Fabricio. <laughs> it's hard to know what content to put out there, but if somebody asks for some specific, it definitely provides the motivation to create it. That's a great idea, just generally. I love that idea. Thanks. Do we have any other questions, folks? OK, if everybody's OK, uh, first I'm going to stop the recording here. Hang on. I can figure out how to stop the recording here.